Welcome to the Robo Show. I'm your host, Chad Robo Show, and uh, on today with a good friend of mine, uh, Matt Height. Uh, Matt Height is a retired uh, United States Navy SEAL, uh, Iraq veteran, bronze star for Valor, uh, amazing military career, and uh, has worked a lot with us at Mighty Oaks as the chairman of our advisory board has been since we started our advisory board, and uh, you know, been a body, bunch of Mighty Oak sessions. And uh, so we just, we just got a really long, great history of personal friendship. And, uh, and this topic I want to talk about today, I think it's perfect, perfect uh, topic for Matt to speak about because we have some shared experiences in Iraq and Afghanistan, work with local nationals. Uh, so I want to talk a lot about that. But before we get started, I uh, want to introduce Matt. What's going on, Matt? How you doing? Hey, good morning, Chad. Good to see you again. Coming it's been to a while, us. it seems yeah. like. Yeah, it has been a while. Coming to us, what, Coronado right now, right? That's right. Yep. So Sunny Matt, Coronado. Perfect day in paradise again. <laughs> we, we got some steaming heat in uh, in Houston right now. So Yeah. Well, it's hard to get. I Look, I'll tell you what. I mean, as, you know, horrible as California is in every other way, the weather's hard to beat. It's really, it's really quite <laughs> nice. But uh, it's been difficult, you know, over the years, that's becoming less of a priority as we see uh, the world changing. But mass for now, here we are. Yeah, Matt, we could, we could do a whole show on the mass exodus of California and why people. Yeah, easily. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so speaking of exodus, like, this kind of ties in good. I'm glad you said that. Speaking of exodus, what we have in, with our troops right now uh, in Afghanistan is we're finally having an exodus after 20 years of United States military being in Afghanistan after 20 years, you know, I, I did, I went to Afghanistan eight times. My son went once, uh, which is crazy to me that two generations of people would be in the same war. So yeah. just for the record, set a record straight. I am happy that the United States is withdrawing from Afghanistan, uh, but it's bittersweet for me because it's, if it's not done right, there's a lot of consequences. And one of the consequences we're seeing is a, a repeat in history what America, uh, I believe American military and America as a nation has had this really horrible history. And I hate to ever say anything about bad about America because I love our country, but you have to, if you love, love something, you got to say the good things and the bad. And one of the good thing, one of the bad things that we've done is when we finish a war and we leave, we haven't had the history of leaving correctly. In Vietnam, we left the South Vietnamese who worked with our troops to fend for themselves and they were killed by the North Vietnamese communists. And in the Gulf War, we, we, left, uh, we left some of the defectors there that helped us do the invasion in the Gulf War behind, and they were slaughtered by Saddam. In the Iraqi War, which you could talk more about, we, we, we left uh, Al-Assad Air Base, just pulled out, left these Iraqis uh, there to be killed by insurgents or whatever happened there. And now uh, the current administration has announced in September 11th, we're gonna be withdrawing US troops from Afghanistan, and we've given, I'm kind of giving the history here, we're given, we're, we're giving 26,500 visas, special visas for Afghans who worked with us. And the problem that we have with it is, there was 80,000 Afghans that worked with our US military over the last 20 years, many of them who are, some of them, many of them who worked with special operations who can't even get that, because they have classified programs, they can't get their visas, and uh, these 80,000 uh, Afghans have families. They served alongside of us. These were our, to military guys. These were our brothers. Like they, they were willing to die for us. We were willing to die for them. We served next to them. And we have a, we have a very pro-immigration, so-called pro-immigration administration right now, who's made this decision to leave these guys behind. Hundreds of thousands of people are coming across our Mexican border, but we have tens of thousands, tens of thousands who need us to do the right thing and bring these Afghans out of Afghanistan because if they don't, they're going to be slaughtered. In the last few months, we've seen 30 provinces of Afghanistan overtaken by the Taliban and family members are starting to rat each other out because they're scared of what's gonna happen. And they're, they're like rats drowning right now. They're trying to survive and so they're ratting each other out saying, hey, he worked with the US troops uh, in order to survive and the Taliban will uh, not just kill them, but slaughter them and their families in probably a grotesque and horrible way, if we want to be honest, uh, what's going to happen. Uh, we've seen this happen in Afghanistan. We've been part of it. And so that's the kind of uh, the groundwork for what I want to talk about today. And uh, I really hope this, you know, we could talk a lot about it. And I hope this uh, gets the attention of the administration to do the right thing and, and grant some special 
visas to get the rest of these Afghans out. Yeah, it's a disturbing story. I mean, like you said, I mean, we've seen this before, you know, it obviously reminds you of what happened in South Vietnam, um, you know, back in the early 70s, and then subsequently kind of spread to Cambodia, you know, really, I mean, I don't think the, the Cambodian genocide was probably going to happen unless we had bailed out of South Vietnam the way that we did. And you had all these, you know, obviously, these people that had supported us over those uh, over that very long war who uh, were sent off to re-education camps if they're lucky. And because, I mean, at least the, you know, at least the, the Viet Cong was communist and they had some sort of a, like, well, we'll just, you know, we'll just re-educate you to be communist and then you can kind of rejoin society. I mean, Taliban is not going to have that kind of grace. Taliban doesn't, you know, obviously, uh, it's a zero sum game. If you were on the other side of the coin from them, you're dead. I mean, simple as that. And I, you know, this happened, I was in Ramadi in 2007, uh, doing intelligence operations and recruiting sources there after the city had been largely pacified in 2006, when it's very, very dangerous place. And, you know, at the time, Ramadi was being kind of heralded as an example of the entire surge that eventually happened in, you know, that year when I was there. And so, um, you know, I had recruited some incredible sources there, and we were able to uh, foil a huge plot that was going to uh, drag Ramadi back into chaos and eliminate the Al-Qaeda leadership cell that had put it together. And the guys that I recruited to do that um, obviously were local guys. And subsequent to, to kind of that leadership change, these guys kind of uh, took a, a leadership uh, role in, uh, in the area. But once, you know, 2011 rolled around and we just completely, uh, you know, left the country, uh, ISIS came into Ramadi and they had lists. And they came in and murdered all my sources. They murdered everybody that I worked with over there. And I, you know, was constantly checking back when I could with the guys who were still operating uh, in the area and were familiar with, you know, what, what I'd been working on at the time. And they're like, yeah, sorry, bro. I mean, they're all, they're all gone. Everybody got taken out. And so obviously we're, in the, we're seeing, essentially that process be repeated now in Afghanistan right now as, uh, you know, obviously I think they're probably uh, letting some people come in and you know, turn over their equipment and weapons and so forth in the hopes that they'll be spared, but that's no guarantee for them either. And, uh, you know, obviously since, you know, we rely heavily on, not only intelligence sources, but local people who work in uh, in these places where we deploy to do all you know various work for us, interpreters and you know other you know other types of work. Um, all those people are at risk, uh, and to you know just like walk away from them, you know again like we've done time after time. I mean, it, it really sort of you know. To, to be honest, I mean, when this all, you know, back in the day, and you know, around 9-11, obviously, I'm sure the both of us, I didn't know you then, but we were both, you know, ready to go and, um, and participate in that, uh, in those wars, because our country had been attacked. But once again, you know, we gone into both of these situations without any kind of uh, full spectrum plan of like, okay, congratulations, you conquered this country. Now what? Like, we don't have an answer to that now what question. And until we get a good answer to that now what question, we should really reconsider, uh, you know, military involvement, because this is, you know, this is a recurring theme. It's a, it's a stain on our country, frankly. And it's, you know, and, and then you have the, the issue where, you know, how many people have we lost in these wars? Uh, particularly in Afghanistan, tw over 20 years, you know, Hunter was there, 
like you said, and you were there both, I mean, father and son, which is just absurd, really. And so here we are again with, you know, leaving, having accomplished what exactly? Like what ultimately yeah. did we actually accomplish in 20 years? So I think it really calls into question, yeah. uh, you know, our foreign policy strategies and our military capability as it, as it pertains to anything other than just the initial you know, hammer session of going in there and crushing all, uh, you know, obvious enemies and yeah. Bin Laden. That, yeah. But beyond that, not so good. Yeah, capture killed a lot of bad guys, a lot of terrible people. But I mean, they were replaced right away. I mean, it fill in the void. And, uh, you know, I, I do believe and it's it pains me to say, but I do believe when we leave in September, if we really do, if we leave in September, uh, within months, it'll be right back uh, the way it was when we got there. Uh, and the threat against the United States will be the same, if not worse, uh, because, you know, we, we really have not made an impact. I, I believe we, you know, we constantly beat the Taliban, but we have not made an impact in the long sum game. And, you know, but when you look at these, like you said, you're, you're that we really have to rely, especially those of us in special operations, but I think even in conventional forces, we have to rely on these local nationals to be able to do the work that we do uh, when we go into these countries. I mean, we don't know the areas, we don't know the, uh, especially in, you know, common guerrilla warfare and, you know, un unconventional warfare. We just don't know how uh, these areas, how people operate. And so we really have to rely on these, these locals. And I, I think the, it's best captured, not by own experience. We look at what Bin Laden did. When Bin Laden planned the, the attack on the, the Twin Towers, uh, for those that don't know the history, he simultaneously, uh, as he planned the attack on the Twin Towers, he also planned the assassination of Ma Ahmad Massoud, the leader of the Northern Alliance. Uh, and he went in with, you know, sent two guys in the day before 9-11 with cameras to interview him. Uh, like most, you know, Afghan warlords, they love the cameras. And he, he fell for it and came in and they, they killed him. They assassinated him. So why did, why did Bin Laden assassinate Massoud? Because uh, he knew when he attacked the Twin Towers and we went in Afghanistan, we would need an alliance to be able to fight the Taliban. We would need to align with the Northern Alliance, the Mujahideen, which the, you know, Massoud was a, the head of. And uh, so he, he killed, he assassinated Massoud, tried to fracture the Northern Alliance, and he did. Many of them, when they saw Massoud was, you know, he was an icon to them. When they saw Massoud was dead, they jumped to the Taliban. And so it really, uh, he knew that we needed those local nationals. And, uh, and we went there and uh, early on, and we definitely utilized those local nationals. And I could tell you that while we lost a lot of guys in Afghanistan, uh, we had so many lives saved because of those Afghans that fought side by side with us. This episode of the Robo Show is brought to you by iron-neck.com. Iron Neck is uh, the world's number one neck strengthening device. You guys don't know, in uh, 2006, I was in Afghanistan and uh, broke my neck and... Uh, if you want to read about how, that story, a crazy story of how I broke my neck, uh, it's in my book, An Unfair Advantage. You can go and check it out. But coming back from Afghanistan, uh, after that's when I had all my big MMA fights and my neck. And the VA wanted to do fusion, and I refused to do fusion, and I just opted to just strengthen my neck, keep my neck strong. Uh, so since, man, all these years fighting through all my fights and MMA and jiu-jitsu, I've always been very important that I keep the muscles of my neck strong because the bro the bones in my neck are broken off and so I don't have that stability and so neck strengthening has always been a very important thing to me. I've always just improvised ways to do it using body weight, using different kind of improvised things that I'd make up. But now uh, I don't have to do that anymore because I have an, an iron neck uh, device which helps me to uh, not only strengthen my neck but, uh, but do it in a safe way. The, the way the device works is that you know, it's, it, it's on a rotator so it as you move your neck, the, road, the point of uh, where the tension is actually moves uh, around your head. And so super uh, effective and safe way to strengthen your neck. And whether you have a neck injury or not, I think in, uh, in sports or just in, in, in life, it's really important to have a good, strong uh, neck. If your neck's strong, your hips are strong, your body's going to be strong. And so check it out, iron-neck.com. If you enter promo code RobyShow, uh, R O B I C H A U X, my last name. You'll get 10% off. And uh, I'm really doing this because I, I love it myself and I want everybody out there, especially those with bad necks, to be able to take care of themselves. 
And so I really thought it was a great product to push out and partner with. And uh, these guys are pretty awesome. They're a Texas-based company. Iron-neck.com. No doubt. I mean, Same here. I mean, the, the live save, yeah, right. like on my operation, you know, I had a big operation in Ramadi back then. Um, and, you know, we're talking about a plot that included three suicide truck bombs that were 2,000 pounds of explosives and chlorine gas and four SVS attacks that were going to, that were directed toward, you know, U.S. and coalition officers. I mean, had this, had these attacks come off, I mean, it would have been, you know, we're talking about hundreds of people that would have been killed at least. And so, yeah, I mean, these guys who put their lives on the line going out there, uh, you know, meeting with terrorists on my behalf and getting them to expose themselves so that our guys can go in and, and get them, uh, you know, that's, <laughs> that's a, that's a very, uh, you know, that's a very dangerous and admirable, incredible thing to do. And I, I, I look at my sources that I worked with, with just tremendous admiration and respect because I knew the risk that they were taking on my behalf. And it was, you know, probably the greatest leadership challenge of my life to convince uh, guys who, <clears throat> in a language that I don't speak, in a culture that I'm not from, to align with my interests and risk their lives to accomplish missions that I'm giving them. That's literally what I'm doing. And we're sitting here, you know, this is what these people do for us. And then we're like, oh, well, sorry, we can't get you, a, you know, a visa or whatever. Like, good right. luck with that. I, it's just, it, you know, you know, I don't think there's any, you know, necessarily, uh, I don't know, ill intent behind it. It's just these, it's just, Over we don't time. care. And, and it just, it's, it's a lack of, you know, when you talk about bin Laden and I mean, what makes me think, why did that, why did he even get spun up on us? It was because we went into uh, Saudi Arabia, Arabia very heavily prior to the Gulf war. And this was super offensive to a lot of Muslims who thought, okay, we don't want these infidels on our land. And, you know, you can debate, you know, Muslim theology all day long, but <laughs> The reality is they don't like it. And so we just did it again. Uh, we just sat in a Muslim country for 20 years, straight trashing it, nothing really got better. And now we're giving it back to them, trashed. And all the people that helped us are about to get killed. So it's like pretty decent chance that there's some people in uh, Afghanistan right now who are thinking, yeah, I think I could get some payback against the Americans here down the road. And so we just keep, you know, shooting ourselves in the foot here with our, uh, you know, with our policies and how we handle this. And it, we really need to, you know, obviously the whole Iraq thing, we had no clue about what we were going to be uh, in control of once we gained control of that country. And, and we completely screwed that up. That was a disaster. Everybody knows it. Disbanding the army and all the other things that happened. And so, and it just made everything worse and it, and it, it put our guys at risk. And, um, you know, this, this lack of, uh, you know, true ability to sort of understand what we're about to enter into in a military conflict is, uh, you know, it needs to get figured out here because we keep doing the same thing over and over and getting the same crappy results. This is something we talk about at Mighty Oaks. If what you're doing isn't working, why don't you try something different? Hello, yeah. what we're doing here is not working. Let's do it different. We have an opportunity to do that right now. One of the things, one of the things you said that uh, made me think, like <clears throat> we talk about how courageous these guys are to, to jump in our fight and do these dangerous things we ask them to do either with us or, or on our behalf. Uh, there's, a, there's a difference between a U.S. Uh, military person being overseas doing these courageous things that our guys do is the difference between what we do and what they do. What we do is we're, our family's 3,000 miles away. When they make that decision, they're not putting just their li lives on the line. They're putting their entire wives and kids' lives on the line. And I'll be honest with you, like, I don't, I don't mind putting my life on the line, but if, if my wife and kids was a consequence as well, you know, that's a whole different, that's a whole different uh, set of circumstances. But that's what these, that we're asking these people to do. They don't just, they're not just going to get, killed if they get caught doing what we're doing. Their, their wives and children are going to get killed as well. And they do it anyway. And the reason I believe 
I can't speak for Iraq, but I, I can tell you that my experience in Afghanistan, the reason I believe these guys came on to do that is be, and put their, not only their lives in danger, but their, their wives and children's lives in danger is because they are, it's hard for Americans to comprehend this, but they are patriots uh, of their country and they want freedoms in their country. They want their country a different way than the Taliban wants it to be. And they were willing to take their risk to fight for that. And we promised them that. Uh, yep. We promised them that we would liberate them from the Taliban. And that, that's, how, that's the reason they didn't put, just put their lives on the line, but they put their wives and children's lives on the line as well. And they, they believed in us for that promise and they were willing to fight and, and die uh, for that. Because they're patriots. Uh, I mean, like again, when you think of patriot, you think of America, but think of being an, an Afghan wanting better for your wife and, and kids and you're a patriot for your country and willing to do that fight. And now, uh, you know, we, we were not able to keep that promise. And if we leave them and we leave them there, uh, everything they did for us was in vain. And, and they, they, you know, these guys can be, will be slaughtered and killed. For sure. And I, look, I mean, you know, you bring a good point. I mean, when you're, when you're recruiting an intelligence source, one of the things that you need to understand is why are you doing this? What is the, re you know what I mean? Like, because if you don't really understand why the guy is doing it, then, you know, you could be getting manipulated and uh, putting yourself at risk, right? So it's important for intelligence collection people to understand the motivations behind why their sources are doing what they're doing. And my kind of rock star source that I had in Ramadi that really, you know, took down this huge organization and foiled this plot, this guy was a very devout, a uh, Muslim man who had, uh, he had been in the Iraqi army in the past, you know, way in the past. And so he, you know, he's a pretty sharp guy and, and knew kind of military tactics. And, but he was, you know, he was so upset about how Al Qaeda and JTJ were, were, they would just kill Muslims and rob them, take their, you know, take their delivery truck full of whatever, kill them, throw their body on the side of the road and leave. And so, you know, they have some very strict, uh, you know, guidelines around how people are buried and how people are respected in death and so forth. And, and to just leave bodies out on the road, like they were doing this, this, this guy was just like, I, 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 this can't go on. You know, he was, he was fed up with it. Like this, and, and even still, you know, frankly, the only reason why this was happening, at least at the point at which I met him was because we were there. I mean, if we had never come there, this situation that he was reacting to wouldn't be going on. So we came in, created this set of circumstances, and then his reaction to that was, hey, you know, what these people are defiling my faith that he really believed in. And this is a guy, when he met with me, he would come to meet with me. And, you know, at times he would, I had a prayer rug for him and he would go outside and he'd want to just pray for a while. Well, okay, man, sure. You know, we had a good relationship and I respected, you know, his culture and his religion and, and what, how he wanted to do it. And he knew I was a Christian and he respected that. And we, you know, we really had a, a strong bond. And then to find out, you know, after, after he had done these amazing things, how he had essentially liberated, you know, his, uh, his community from a terrible scourge of terrorists. You know, then, you know, when the next round of terrorists rolled in in 2011, uh, the ISIS guys, him and his entire family got wiped out. No questions asked. They don't care. I mean, you know, we're playing games here with people's lives. And, you know, we have a lot of money to throw around in these places. And, and it, it's very tempting for people to work with us when we wave dollar bills in front of their face. And, um, you know, and they, and they, like you said, we made promises to them and, you know, we rug pulled them. Let's, let's be honest. I mean, that's what happened and it's happening again and it keeps happening and it's a problem. And if your country keeps doing this, you know, going into some, you know, developing country, you know, conducting extensive military operations and, and destroying infrastructure and everything. And then just walking away and being like, "Hey, later," uh, you know, th this isn't a this isn't a way to make friends and influence people in the world going forward. And so, <laughs> it's a real problem. Yeah, yeah, man, you know, terribly, you know, so sorry to happen to you because I know 
that, you know, these how, how you feel about these type of relationships. You know, I got a guy that's there right now. Uh, uh, and, you know, this guy, this guy not only saved my life multiple times, but he saved the lives of, my, of several of my close friends who are still here. And so me and my, me and my several friends, we were like, man, you know, I don't, I don't want to say his name, but, you know, he saved our lives. Like, how could we leave him there right now? And that's one of the reasons I'm prompted to do this episode because it's not too late. Like America could still do the right thing. This particular guy, I'm saying like this guy, again, he saved my life. He saved my friend's lives multiple times. I lived in his homes, I ate dinner with his family. I played soccer with his kids. Like I love this guy. Uh, and, and I would still give, you know, if we were in the battlefield, I'd give him a life for this guy. I know he would give his life for me. And uh, he, he's, his family has already ratted him out because not because they're bad people because they're scared. And, yeah. and they ratted him out and said, Hey, he was working with special operations and, and he can't get the visa. And he's like, I am going to, I'm going to watch my wife and kids be tortured and killed in front of me. And then they're going to kill me. That's what he's telling me. Right. I mean, I'm, we, we've talked to him and he's telling me, he's like, can you guys help me? Like, I'm going to watch my wife and kids be tortured and killed because of what I did with you guys. Can you help me get out? And I don't have any power to get him out. And uh, the best, most power I have right now is this, this microphone is sitting across from you t- saying this, telling this story in hopes that the administration will hear that some of you listening right now, I'll call your congressman and say, this is not right that we do this. We have to give these people these visas. I mean, what I want to tell him is, hey, go get, to, let's get you to Tijuana and walk you across the border because uh, yeah, that's, whatever. I mean, that seems to be the only way uh, if you come with your kids, they're going to welcome you in. Like, I mean, we let hundreds of thousands of people across the border that we don't even know who they are, but yet we have, you know, 80,000 people that, that served alongside of our guys that saved their lives of our American troops and we can't get them in. I mean, it's the oh. least, I mean, the least you could do. I mean, given the circumstances and given the fact that, you know, we basically any infrastructure that, uh, that they ever had was, you know, liquidated within the first six months of that war. Some of and these guys, have everything else that was built subsequently was really built for our use anyway. And, uh, and so it's like, yeah, do you think we could just throw some bones at these people? I mean, this is really quite disturbing. And some of them and have, I, a, I've, I've, I've talked to you about that guy before and I know how much he means to you yeah. and your experiences with him. And so it breaks my heart that, you know, you're, that this is the situation he's in. I mean, some of these guys have up to like top secret level, top secret level clearances, right? I mean, most of them will have like secret level clearance. So they've been, most of these guys have been heavily vetted. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, you know, I, in Iraq, my interpreters were contractors that came out of the U S and Canada and so forth. And so they had, you know, they knew where they were going to come back, but you know, these sources and all the people that worked on the base, I mean, cause you, you know, look, I mean, when you go into a, area and smash a bunch of stuff and shoot a bunch of buildings up and you know set a bunch of stuff on fire you know it it has a creates an unemployment problem okay and then you come in you're like oh okay so we're gonna take over this area and we're gonna need some local people to help us uh, maintain the facilities i mean those are the kind of people even who are at risk here who who just did essentially menial labor but they did it for us because they didn't have jobs because we, you know, melted down their town. I mean, so, and these people need to get, uh, to, to go through this. And I mean, you know, it just, you look at the problems that we, you know, that are loudly discussed in this country right now. And you're like, are you serious? Like these are, you know, the people who are living through this exact situation that we're describing, you know, this isn't some like, oh, you're going to be canceled, bro. You yeah. won't be on social media anymore, bro. Like you might lose your job. No, sorry, your family sorry. is going to get executed straight up in front of you. And then, you know, they're going to torture you to death. I mean, this is, these people are brutal. It's a little more offensive than me called the wrong pronoun. Like it's unbelievable. <laughs> I mean, I mean uh, just I mean, like it's the, the disconnect of reality, right? Mm-hmm. Like we're living here in this country in a fantasy land that doesn't exist and all these people are are just living this fantasy and it's like actually no there's actual real things happening in this planet that you need to be aware of and and pay attention to and deal with and you know to complain about anything that you're dealing with here in the united states compared to people like we're describing who helped us out i mean it's absurd 
on its face. And it just, I, I, it's like, it's so dis, uh, disturbing to see this and, and, it, and to just realize like, there's not much you can do to get uh, the media or the government to pay attention to right. something that's an actual serious problem when they're so wrapped around the axle about, you know, transgender, whatever it is. Some NFL guy came out. I, I remember I was watching the Padres game yesterday and it's like, you know, news alert, so and such NFL guy comes out as gay. They're like, so what, dude? Like, yeah. whatever, man. Like, you do, who cares? Like, why do I need to be told this? Like, this, these are not serious things that we're discussing. And there's very serious problems. Like this that, one. <laughs> and this is just one of many. One of many, yeah. And, and, and we're sitting here, you know, alert. Some dude came, are, what? This yeah. is, it just, it and seems this, like we're living in some kind of a bad movie or something. It's so bizarre. I, 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 it, it's hard to wrap your brain around what's going this on. Isn't a, this isn't a, like, one side of the aisle or another. This isn't a Republican or Democrat or conservative right. or liberal thing. In fact, this is a humanitarian issue that you think of anything. Everybody come together in Amer as Americans and say, this is the right thing to do. Uh, guys, we, we run out of time, but I just want to challenge you. This is something I'm super passionate about. I know Matt is call your congressmen, uh, your state representatives, and uh, make it known, make your voices known that this is not okay for us to do this as a country to these people who have served alongside of our troops for the last 20 years. Uh, we've done it wrong in the past, as we've got a history of doing that, uh, but I think we still have time to do the right thing. Uh, it's as simple as somebody, as you know, the president uh, writing an executive order to, or whatever he needs to do to up the number of special visas uh, up to 80,000 and uh, Super, a super simple thing for them to do, and uh, and they could get these. The guys least, up. the yeah. very least that we could, literally, the very least thing we could do is is to offer these people an opportunity to survive, and that's, that's right. it. That's it. Yeah, yeah. All right. Thanks so much. Thank you, Matt. It was really good to see. You. I, I'll get out there and Great see, to you. see you again, Chad. God All bless right. you, brother. God bless, bro.